Is it working? Yeah. Good morning and welcome. Uh, this is the 18th Sunday after Pentecost. And unfortunately, I have a very background. First of all, I am a called teacher in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. I'm not ordained, so therefore we're not having communion today. So that is one of the things. And I'm noticing, all right, I have a background during the summer. I do a lot of side jobs. And if you look at the light up here, <laughs> our stoplight's working very well, our warning light up above you. And I'll have a simple explanation for that. The LEDs are fine, but there's a controller inside. All these, anything with LED has a controller. And guess what's going bad? The controller is going bad. So unfortunately, what it means is you have to replace the whole thing. So like, if I've had this happen in a bunch, you may have had some lights at home that's kind of start blinking a little bit. The LED part's fine. There's a little thing right behind it that says, here, turn on. Well, that's saying turn on, turn off, turn on, turn off. And if it bothers you, move. <laughs> so first of all, uh, as most of you know, Pastor is gone, and uh, he and his family moved. I'm not sure exactly where they went, because it's none of my business, quite frankly. <laughs> but they're gone for today, and uh, he asked me, if, uh, as an elder, if I'd be willing to step in. This is not my first time I've done this. I used to help at another church of, uh, on Concordia on Belmont quite often when they were without a pastor. So um, he was supposed to leave me I know his sermon, which I did not get. <laughs> so therefore, I will do like I normally have done in the past. And we're just going to go, and if you have a bulletin, kind of follow along. We're going to go back over and look at the lessons and how they relate to each other. So that's typically the way I like to kind of, it's more of an educational experience. Why? I am a teacher by trade, so therefore that's kind of the way I do things. So, blessings, why don't you stand up and let's greet each other. And now the light's working, amazing. <laughs> well, good morning. Good morning. Morning. I have an announcement I want to make after church. I will try to remember. <laughs> Good morning. Hi. Hi. Oh, good morning. Good morning. Thank you. How are you doing today? You're here, right? All right, we'll begin with our opening hymn.
you're able. We make our beginning in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. But if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is merciful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess when we are dangerous, sinful, and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done, and by what we have left undone, we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, and have mercy on us. Forgive us. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for the sake of God forgives us all of our sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives the power to become the children of God, and bestows on them the Holy Spirit. May the Lord, who has begun this good work in us, bring us to completion in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. You may be seated for next part.
Almighty God, you exalted your Son to the place of all honor and authority. Enlighten our minds by your Holy Spirit that, confessing Jesus as Lord, we may be led into all truth. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Old Testament reading is from Ezekiel chapter 18. The word of the Lord came to me. What do you mean by repeating this proverb concerning the land of Israel? The fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. As I live, declares the Lord God, this proverb shall no more be used by you in Israel. Behold, all souls are mine, the soul of the father, as well as the soul of the son is mine, and the soul who sins shall die. Yet you say, the way of the Lord is not just. Hear now, O house of Israel, is my way not just? Is it not your ways that are not just? When a righteous person turns away from his righteousness and does injustice, he shall die for it. For the injustice that he has done, he shall die. Again, when a wicked person turns away from the wickedness he has committed and does what is just and right, he shall save his life. Because he considered and turned away from all the transgressions that he had committed, he shall surely live, he shall not die. Yet the house of Israel says, the way of the Lord is not just. O house of Israel, my ways are not just. Is it not your ways that are not just? Therefore, I judge you. O house of Israel, every one according to his ways, declares the Lord God. Repent and return from all of your transgressions, lest iniquity be your ruin. Cast away from you all the transgressions that you have committed, and make yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. Why will you die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of anyone declares the Lord God, so turn and live. This is the word of God. Thanks. Thanks. God. We read responsibly from Psalm 25. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. Lord, Indeed, none who wait for you shall be put to shame. They shall be ashamed who are unwantingly treacherous. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. Remember not the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me for the sake of your goodness, O Lord. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his ways. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The epistle lesson is from Philippians chapter 2. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord, and of one mind. Do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you not look only to his own interests, but also the interest of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, 
but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or questioning, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain, even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith. I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you should also be glad and rejoice with me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please rise if you're able. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 21st chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. And when he entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came up to him as he was teaching and said, By what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? Jesus answered them, I also will ask you one question, and if you tell me the answer, then I also will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, where did it come from? From heaven or from man? Well, now they discussed it among themselves, saying, if we say from heaven, he would say to us, why then did you not believe him? But if we say from man... We are afraid of the crowd, for they all hold that John was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, We do not know. And he said to them, Neither will I tell you what, by what authority I do these things. What do you think? A man has two sons, and he went to the first and said, Son, go and work in the vineyard today. And he answered, I will not. But afterward, he changed his mind and went. And he went to the other son and said the same. And this other son answered, Go, sir. I will go, sir. But I did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said the first. Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes go into the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him, but the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even when you saw it, you did not afterward change your minds and believe him. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to Lord Christ. Please be seated. <laughs>
blessing to you from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. As I said earlier, we're going to take a look at the parts. If you have your um, bulletin, it'll be easier. But if you don't, you can just follow along. I'm going to start with the first part from Ezekiel. And I had a hard time when I was reading this passage, this passage not think Ezekiel saw the wheel way up in the center of the sky. Songs I had learned from my childhood. But this is not what this part of Ezekiel is all about. This part of Ezekiel starts out, first of all, if you're not aware of it, it's kind of interesting. Ezekiel was an Israelite, but he was not living in Israel. He was in Babylon. At this point, the children of Israel are captive, and they're living in Babylon. So he's now becoming a prophet to the children of Israel. And the first words of that part is, the words of the Lord came to me. And now he says the next part, and what do you people mean by, and he goes on to this quote, He's asking them a question. In the same way in our gospel, Jesus asks a question of everybody else. So it's kind of interesting how we start these things and they relate together. He starts by asking a question. Why do you say? In our gospel, what happens? Jesus says to the chief priest and by, why do you say about John the Baptist? What do you think? So both of them start with these questions. Well, it comes out down later on after he goes through that quote about the grapes and everything else. He says, yet you say, the way of the Lord is not just. The way of the Lord is not just. Time out. I don't know about you, but my wife, ever since I've been driving, I've known my wife. I visited her. She, we, she grew up in Nebraska. I was from Chicago. And I would drive, and I had a car, so we would drive to her family's house. And I still remember to this very day. Her brother said to her, Joe, we really like Doug, but we hate the way he drives. Okay? And that's kind of the same part of, was that just for them to say? Probably, actually. Because I'm confessing, it's even, I mean, I'll even confess, I'm even worse driver since I came back to Chicago. Because some things that people do make you not do the right thing, even though you do it for the wrong reasons or right reasons. Some of these things happen. The, the say that the way of the Lord is not just. But then it comes back to later on in verse 27. But if a wicked person turns away from the wickedness they have committed and does what is just and right, they will save their life. Time out. I mean, so if I'm wicked and I turn away from my wickedness, I get to save my life, according to Jesus. Well, think about the thieves on the cross. They both were wicked people, but yet Jesus turns to one and says, today he the one turned away from wickedness and says, today you will be with me in paradise, right? Those things are happening all the time around us. The problem is, in our human nature, we say it's not fair. And I have to listen to this every day in my classroom. Mr. Markworth, what you're telling us, it's just not fair. Oh, well, get over it. Because not everything in our human ways of thinking are always fair. I remember my children as we're looking through this, my oldest son would drove me insane all the way through school. I should have listened to my wife in kindergarten when she said, keep him back a year. <laughs> all right, this is a child who refused to even put his name on a piece of paper in kindergarten. Never got any better, by the way. But yet, this is the child who drove me insane all the way through grade school, all the way through high school and even through college. And I kept on looking and I said, of all my children, of my three children, he is the one that I feared most would turn away from God. I really did. It's hard to believe how wrong we can be. Of my three children, I thought the two girls would really get involved within church and everything else and, you know, and read the scripture. 
Guess which one is reading scripture and very involved in this church, youth group, and everything else? My son. The one that drove me totally insane the whole way. And that kind of reminds me of the children of Israel. They were driving Jesus insane, or God insane, during this whole time in Babylon. And they were saying, oh, it's unjust because God doesn't love us anymore because we're in Babylon. Well, all right, guys. We, at school, a bunch of us have been talking a lot. We talk about God is love, right? Well, what is the love that God shared with us? The love was that Jesus Christ died on the cross to forgive us our sins. That was his love. And that same love, you know, is sometimes we don't always feel it that way. So we do come sometimes to have in our lives, we probably had a moment to say, God, where are you? What are you doing? It happens sometimes. We question things. But it comes back to God is love at all times. Sometimes we don't understand what the love is. Example, I had a child when I was in Hannibal who stood up on a snow pile and was getting ready to jump into a puddle of water. I knew what he was going to do. I looked at him and said, if you jump in that puddle of water, the consequence is going to be you're taking your pants off, I'm going to find your paint shirt, I'm going to wrap it around your waist and let your pants dry. So the kid understood the consequences. Guess what he did? You all know what he did already. He jumped in a puddle of water. What did I do? I made him take his pants off and put a paint shirt around his waist until his pants dried. And then I called his parents also during the process. But that's how God, he tells us what the, the results of what our actions are. He says, here's what's going to happen. But he also promises, if you turn away from your wicked ways, good things can happen. And the one kid finally looked at me after doing a bunch of these really dumb acts. I finally looked at him and said, you know what? If I don't love you, I'm going to let you do whatever you want. I don't care. And he goes, what? He said, if I don't love you, I don't really care what you do anymore. I'm not going to correct you. I'm not going to guide you. I'm not going to show you what to do. And that's the blessing what God is. God's love shows us a direction. He says, here's a path I want you to follow. And sometimes we get off the path, and what does he do? He says, follow my path over and over again. Even in the Old Testament, he's telling us the same thing. He's saying, you know, if a wicked person turns away from the wickedness and has committed and does not do what is just, they will save their life. Wait a second. The parable of the two sons. It's almost like Jesus quoted, is quoting this part of the Old Testament. The man had two sons, and he went to the first and said, son, go and work in the vineyard today. And the son says, what does he say? I will not. Flat out tells his father, no, I'm not going to do it. But then guess what he does? He goes to the vineyard anyhow. That's that same like that quote from the, about in the Old Testament, the, the wickedness of what's going on, that if you repent and move on, God will take care of you. So in the same thing, the parable of two sons, you know, everybody finally says, so which is the son that's right? The one that says, I'm going to go and doesn't go, or the one that says, I'm not going to go, and tells the father flat out, I'm not going to do it, but then does what the father asks. And they all knew the answer, which is what? This first son, right? The one who says, I'm not going to do it, but then goes and does what he asks. That is exact, it's almost the exact same idea that was taken out of from Ezekiel. And yet, the same thing that keeps happening over and over again in our lives. Ezekiel says, repent, turn away from all your offenses, and then the sin will not be your downfall. To repent. And it goes over and over again about the last words that he has in that part is repent and live. Hmm. We just finished a confession a couple of minutes ago. And our confession of faith, in essence, we're saying, Lord, we really are not worthy of you. 
and we were repenting of what, we are, what we've done wrong, right? That's part of what happens. And through the Lord's Prayer and everything else, we are called to repentance, just as Ezekiel was calling his people back to repentance of the children of Israel. These are all foreshadowing, saying, this is the way God is working with you now, but Jesus Christ is going to come and tell you, I'm going to take care of this. Philippians chapter 2. From verse 3, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility. Count others more significant than yourselves. <sighs> All right, I'm going to go back to you. Remember what my brothers said I was about a driver? You know why they said I was a lousy driver? Because their comment was, you're too aggressive. And driving in Chicago does not solve that issue for me some days. How do I solve the issue? Well, I, it takes me 45 minutes to get from where I live to get over to St. Philip where I teach every day. And I can say my prayer, Lord, please give me patience. He hears me. I'm kind of like that first person about the wickedness. It's not there. Finally, I remember what my wife does, and I turn on a radio station that I enjoy, which is K-Love. And when, after I turn K-Love on, all of a sudden, it feels like all the pressure from around me goes away. Because as I listen to God's word, word through song, I realize it's not about me. It's not about me rushing to get there. And if someone passes me, it's not the end of the world anymore. Because in my human nature, it is if someone's trying to pass me, what do I do? I speed up. That's my human nature, folks. But when I have Caleb on and listen to God's word, what do I do? I just take my deep breath and say, Lord, thank you. And I just, the guy passes me, so what? I don't care. But yet, that's part of that humility that we have to look at. Make other people more important than us, than yourself, is what Philippians is saying. And as it talks about, it says that Christ being you know, found in human form, he humbled himself. He put others in front of him. It says, therefore, God was highly exalted, him, highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. In whose name do we do this in, though, folks? Whose name? The name of Jesus. It's very simple. It says, when we turn to Jesus' name, we know what it is about. And in verse 13, for it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. And then verse 14 kind of goes back to the Old Testament reading. Do all things without grumbling or disputing. Oh, wait a second. Didn't we hear that about, you know, the, in the Old Testament? We just read that whole thing in there. A clever thing that says, is the way of the Lord not just? It says, do all things without grumbling or disputing. That's what was happening in Israel at the time. They were complaining. They could not see that what was, the problem was, was not God, but was them. And we go through all this. And then it ends in Philippians, right at the very end. All right, I'll ask a question. How many of you have read the five first books of the Bible like Pastor has asked us to do? Some few people have. All right, I get the advantage. I get to listen to the Bible also on the way to school and coming home. I have an uh, app on my phone so I can listen to it. Because verse 17 was interesting to me. Because if you've read, especially Genesis, Exodus, but the favorite book of pastors is what? Leviticus. We know that already. Pastor's favorite book is Leviticus. But verse 17 is what referring back to Leviticus. Even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith. I am glad and rejoice with all of you. 
He said, even if you offer me as a drink offering, if you go through Leviticus and listen to it, first of all, I've learned one thing. Since Moses was, God was asking Moses to write Moses down, it's hard to just read. It's a lot easier to listen to, I found out. Because God through Moses repeats, 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 repeats. You know, the first thing he says, you know, I want you to go to Mount Horeb. And the next thing he says, so Moses went to Mount Horeb. And then he comes back down. So Moses came down from Mount Horeb. But when he was up at Mount Horeb, <laughs> this keeps on rotating through. That's the whole thing. But they also in Leviticus keep going over all the type of offerings we have to give. There are lots of different offerings. And one of them happens to be a drink offering. So this is a reference that is given out by Paul at this time, who was both a Roman and a Jew. He understood the Jewish culture. And so back at that time, they were supposed to be giving these offerings yet to this very day. And they were said, I will, you know, I will gladly be poured out as a drink offering upon a sacrificial offering of your faith. If you, you, know, if you need me, I will put willing to be the offering for whatever has to be done. So that's through Philippians. Basically, you're talking about humility that's there. Babylon was what? Repent. Philippians is humility. And then we get to the final thing of, from Matthew. <clears throat> I love the question that Jesus asked. He said, I'm going to answer your question if you can answer, you know, I won't tell you who I am if you wanted to answer my question. Now, I play the same kid thing with my kids at my birthday because they all, the first question out of their mouth is, how old are you? And I said, you know what, guys, I'll just figure it out. And I give them this huge math problem, which if they can figure it out, we'll give them their, my age. It gets down to that. But most of them finally get about halfway through and said, all right, we're done. We have no idea how old you are because they don't want to put the effort in to figure out what's going on. And that's kind of what's happening right here. When he says, you know, the baptism of John, where does it come from? And what happens? Here the chief priests are doing things, and the, the men, of, men of the temple, this says. By the way, who are the men of the temple? Going back to what we, if you bother read all the rest of these things, it is the uh, Levites. Because when they finally got to Canaan, guess who got no property? By the way, hey guys, make sure you read this. The Levites don't get any property. Because the Levites were in charge of the Ark of the Covenant. And they basically are the priests. They were what they were told to do is one-tenth of all the land, not in the cities, but surrounding cities, you give to the Levites. One-tenth. So that's that tenth idea of giving starts to come out at that point. So we have these things happening. The Levites, the chief priests are there. These are the learned people. They knew scripture forwards and backwards. But they also took things from a very human perspective. Because what do they say? Hey, if we say that it's from God, then they're going to say, why didn't we follow him? But if we say it's from man, the people are going to get upset with us and they're going to get after us. That's a very human reaction to things. Sounds more like lawyers to me than anybody else at that point in time trying to figure it out. You know, how do we get around this thing? So the answer Jesus said I feel like I talk to children some days. I ask them a the question. I don't know. And that's basically what they said. Well, we don't know. And I love what Jesus answered because he told them right up front. He said, if you answer this question, I will tell you about me. Kind of like when I told that one kid. If you do this, here's the consequence. And Jesus did the exact same thing. He said, if I tell you, you know, if you answer this question, I'll answer the question of who I am. And when they said, I don't know, he says, so neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. You won't answer my question, so therefore I'm not going to answer yours. And I told you that up front. They had a choice. And they, they cho the choice that they made was, like a lot of people, I don't know. 
I hear that way too often, by the way, in school every day. I don't know. And finally get that, that parable, which is what I said, that parable is basically based off of Ezekiel, that concept. Because a man goes out, he says, I'm not going to do it, but does it. Then at the end of this thing, I found it interesting, the comments. From verse 32, or even before that, from verse uh, 31, because it says, and they said, the first, and then Jesus said to them, truly I say to you, the tax collectors and prostitutes go into the kingdom of God before you. I'll give you a hint. Guess why I found that very interesting? The tax collectors, who were people that were looked up down on, no one liked tax collectors. Why? Because first of all, they cheated. Because if you owed them $10, they would charge you 11 Oh, wait a second. That kind of reminds me, if you pay with a credit card to the government, they will charge you a fee to do that, right? So it's not much different. It's the tax collector doing something. I'll give you a hint. Why did I find it interesting that the word tax collector, tax collector was used here? Matthew. What was he? Tax collector. It's interesting in his own, well, two parts, him being a tax collector and then talks about the people being prostitutes, that they're going to get into heaven before the elders, the high priest. He's saying, these people have a better understanding about who I am than you guys do. And the last words go to the, back to those priests, and everybody says, and even when you saw it, you did not afterward change your minds and believe him. You did not believe in what John said, and you don't understand who I am. That is our world we live in, folks. Not everybody is going to believe that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. Does it say we don't try to not share Christ with other people, though? And the answer is no. It still says we still try to talk to other people and share with them. But it does let us know that not everybody is going to believe in what they hear. When I was in Missouri, we did, uh, we were in a, an evangelism program that we were in. And I still remember we went to this one man's house. And what was scary is he knew scripture better than I did. Because he had read the Bible totally through five times. But yet he still not believe that Jesus was his savior. He just couldn't see it. And when we talked with him, is interesting, but the fact was he still could not see even reading the scriptures and seeing the Old Testament that pointed to say Jesus is coming and then reading through the Gospels, to him he just could not see that Christ is his Savior, that he needed forgiveness of sins. And one of the things we talked with him is, and we said, do you need forgiveness? And his answer was interesting. He says, Why? I really don't do much wrong. And if you think about it, when we get to this last part of this thing, it's kind of like, who comes to heaven? Who's going to be there? And if I say, I really don't do anything wrong, it's like me saying, I'm a good driver. Heaven help me at that point. No, I'm not. I know it. Until I try to calm things back down. But sometimes people just are not going to see that Christ needs to be in your life. Well, why don't they need it? Because all they have to realize, and I have to realize, that I am a sinner. In essence, I do things that are wrong every day. And without Christ's forgiveness, I'm nothing. That is a hard part for a lot of other people to admit. 
they have a hard time saying, I don't do things right. Because the world say, the world that we live in says, it's all about who? It's all about me. It's all about you. You know, whoever's saying it. It's all about me. It's all about me. So therefore, if it's all about me, it can't be wrong. So why do I need forgiveness? See, that's part of the problem, the world that we're living in. Jesus still says, reach out to those people. We have to talk to them. My neighbor in, when I was living in Chicago, he was one of the most vulgar people I've ever met in my life. He made more, I would say he most, would make more sailors blush at this point in time. He'd come and talk to me, and it was interesting. He put a fence up across one neighbor's side and the back, and for whatever reason, he does not decide to put a fence up, a big fence across our area. My chain link fence was there, a nice small one. And he would come across, and we just have these discussions. And one day his wife walked out. And his wife looked at him and says, you know, you keep talking to Doug. And, and we were having a discussion at the time about well, who knows what. And he looks at, she looks at him and says, have you noticed? You keep on swearing all the time. Has he ever sworn back at you? And he looks at me and goes, no. By the way, that was one of the last times he swore when we were talking. Because sometimes it's not by everything that we say, it's also by our actions. I had to listen to him because I know he was in hurting in a lot of ways. But I don't have to swear back at him to act like I'm part of the good old boy society. And it was interesting. Who changed? It wasn't me. 